I will come later back to the point that Nostra Etate is mostly quoted with regard to um, Catholic Jewish relations, but in fact it deals with Catholic and non-Christian relations. That is already a kind of interesting um, moment that we should somehow um, ponder when well, we really reflect upon when uh, thinking about the special place that um, Jewish Catholic or Catholic Jewish relations have within the range of Catholic and other religion relations. Nostratate did not develop in a vacuum, though, since on the Christian side there had already been approaches to Judaism both within and outside the Catholic Church before the Council. But after the unprecedented crime of the Shoah, the Holocaust, above all, an effort was made in the post-war period towards a theologically reflected redefinition of the relationship of Christianity with Judaism. In fact, it is at the backdrop of the historical perspective that the watershed character of Nostra Aetate can be fully appreciated. This historical perspective shows us the densely intricated intersection of, on the one hand, the history of theological thought, and on the other hand, the history of politics, church and state politics, especially in Europe, a sort of a quiet homeland for Christianity once Christianity spread out from the Jewish homeland where the Jew, Jesus Christ, had lived, preached to the Jewish apostles, died, and as we Christians believe, was risen to eternal life. And where, as early as in those centuries when Christianity was spreading, also many <coughs> Jews found their new home as the land of Israel had become an inhabitable place for the Jewish people. The history of relations between Christians and Jews thus presents itself as a very complex story. A story that has moved between proximity and distance, between brotherhood and alienation, love and hate, and lamentably the story from being complex has more often than not, turned into a story of guilt, injustice, marginalization on the Christian side towards the Jewish brothers and sisters. But the story was not all black. In the history of Christianity, we find people like, for example, Ignatius of Loyola, who, when accused of being Jewish, retorted that he would be greatly privileged if that were so. What? To be related to Christ our Lord and to Our Lady, the glorious Virgin Mary? There was the scholar Johannes Reuchlin, who in 1510 published the first Christian defense of the Talmud, which had been consistently defamed and publicly burned during the preceding centuries. Popes in the Renaissance became avid readers of Kabbalah, so much so that there is a whole branch of Kabbalah until today considered to be a kind of Christian spirituality. Robert Bellamine, one of the rectors of the Gregorian University where I mostly teach, already in 17th century consulted Jewish scholars for questions regarding biblical exegesis, and of course he himself undertook it to learn biblical Hebrew in order to study the texts in their original language. It needs to be said just as complex as this story has been from the very beginning of fledging Christianity, even at present, at a time of after Nostra Aetate and a period of Catholic-Jewish dialogue, the relationship continues being complex, since the very nature of this relationship is complex, even though we all hope, and I think we can be confident, that with Nostra Aetate and with these 50 years of Catholic teaching Nostra Aetate and all levels within the Catholic Church that the complexity will not become such tragic hostility ever again. Why is the nature of this relationship so complex? On the Christian side, this is quite simple to answer. 
On the one hand, Jesus without Judaism is not conceivable, not comprehensible. Of course, the early Christian community attended the Jewish liturgy in the temple first, and after the destruction of the second temple in, in 70 AD, in the various synagogues spread out in the Hellenistic world. Paul, on his various missionary journeys, always went first to the synagogues, preaching his gospel to Jews before turning to Gentiles. In this sense, it can be affirmed that the very first split or the very first separation that happened within the Christian church that continues until this very day is not the schism between the Eastern or the so-called Orthodox Church and the Western or Latin Catholic Church, but the first schism, the first split happened between the church and the synagogue. The Jesuit theologian Erich Chibara, a German with a Polish name, has referred to this shift as the primal rift, the Urges, a kind of archetypal division from which Chibara has derived all later divisions that have led to an essential incompleteness of the Catholic Church. Why this description so far has coined the common assessment of affairs in such a way that the relationship between Jews and Christians is described as essentially asymmetrical, meaning that while it needs to be affirmed that Christianity originates in Judaism, thereby in some sense remaining in the relationship of dependency of Judaism when it comes to its own, its Christian identity, Judaism seems to represent an independent or autonomous religion, clearly conceivable without an intrinsic reference to Christianity. Of late, though, it appears that the complexity of the Christian-Jewish relations <coughs> has hit the Jewish home as well. Present research tends to assume that the process of separation between Judaism and Christianity extended over a period of time far longer than previously assumed. It was not, as it had been believed and taught until the 80s and 90s of last century, it was not a process that was essentially completed shortly after the already mentioned destruction of the Second Temple in the year 70. Archaeological discoveries demonstrate a worship, a common worship between Christians and Jews that continued in the Hellenistic realm, in the Hellenistic realm, far into the third, fourth, and even fifth century in Syria, maybe well into the seventh century. That means the very same period that saw rabbinical Judaism shaping the Judaism that we know today. At the Carmel Bear Center in Rome, we will host a lecture in two weeks delivered by an Israeli professor entitled Did Rabbinic Judaism Emerge Out of Christianity? As Professor Israel Yuval, the lecturer, sees it, the very fact that the Talmudic sources are silent about Christianity should be read as also very telling. The silence, this silence, claims Yuval, does not reflect an indifferent stand towards Christianity, but rather a conscious attempt to ignore it. And even more so, according to him, it stands to reason to assume that while the articulated discourse ignored Christianity, the hidden transcript actively fought against it. Indeed, the origin of some central religious ideas in a rabbinic Judaism, such as the creation of the oral law, can be related to the existence of Christianity as a rival religion. So, Professor Yuval. In other words, there has been an internal conflict between Christian and Jews that touches, a conflict that touches both 
self-identities, and at least since the days of Sigmund Freud, we have become aware of how dangerous identity issues can become. Indeed, the relationship of Judaism and Christianity at the end of the day is very much, in my view, a relationship not of mother or father and son and daughter, but it is a relationship of two brothers, or rather two sisters, if you prefer. It is a family dispute. And as we know from scripture, at the beginning of violence was a fratricide. Violence between two brothers. But what an exciting and healing period of time we are living in, where the suppressed relatedness can come out to light and shine, and can be put into words, can, can be articulated in places like this, in places like the Kanal Beer Center in Rome. In 1965, when Nuncio Tate was promulgated, we were still only at the beginning of this process. So it cannot come as a surprise to learn how bumpy the road was that led to the final promulgation of Nostra Tati. <coughs> there is a whole series of objections that just swirled around the floor when, whenever the draft of Nostra Aetate was presented in the council's meetings. And um, the original design had to be completely um, shelved, renewed. The idea, the initial project of John 23rd to have a document reserved, dedicated exclusively to um, the Catholic-Jewish relations could not hold up. It had to be revised and finally could survive in some ways only under the umbrella of the document uh, dedicated to inter-religious inter relations. And of course you can <coughs> immediately guess the reasons for the resistance that there was. One block was the already mentioned theological training that um, the fathers of the council were used to and hold on onto. These were especially um, the bishops from Latin America, Italy, and Spain. And Spain. The objection there argued that Nostra Aetate's principal tenets were against the traditional teaching authority or the magisterium of the church, the steady tradition expressed in the scriptures in the church fathers, council and popes. Prove those tenets from tradition was their challenge. And begin with scripture. Let not guilt feelings take over <coughs> Catholic theology. A second, and maybe even at times at least more forceful argument was put forward um, in the context of the Middle East, especially the bishops from Arab countries feared negative consequences for Christians in their home countries. And they felt that the price to pay was simply too high. The third objection came from bishops of Asia and Africa. If the council deals with the spiritual bonds between the church and the Jewish people, they said, then enlarge this, the pattern, enlarge the view to embrace two-thirds of the world's religious people who are not Christians or Jews. Get out of the Eurocentric view, join globalization. All of these arguments keep their topical character. They are all, in some ways, still valid. Some valid to, to be considered, and let's say myself and my daily life, I, I have to face these arguments, <coughs> these objections 
almost every day. The long road of the making of the document Nostra Etate, in fact, reads as a peculiar mixture of the Nkur, the shoes of the fishermen, and a good portion of James Bond. And here comes Friedhelm is now really the role of Cardinal Bayer. I mean, there's so much written about the um, Cardinal, I don't want to burden our lecture now with that. There's, um, but it's really um, amazing to see a scholar, it was basically a biblical scholar for um, the Old Testament, was rector of the biblical and the biblical history grow. By then he was called first to deal with ecumenism, to so really with um, Christian denominations, non Catholic denominations, only meant to move on to be entrusted with the role of drafting most of that. But what Carl Bear then did once the first draft was completely um, rejected, um, he started to become to develop his amazing diplomatic skills. And he had already, um, as, a, you know, as, a, as a German, really, um, he was from the countryside, so um, you know, the Black Forest. So, so um, now to deal with the American Jewish Congress, with um, the Israel's Prime Minister, with um, the, the hardliners, the Catholic hardliners, the bishops, and you know, um, the council, it was, um, Really, um, a miracle, and at the same time, uh, a crime story, a thriller that made um, 20, October 28th in the end happen. He, um, he saw, saw the doc document C, slide John 23rd, as you all know, and did not. And, um, and there you can see um, also the, the, the definite quality of Kamalaya. He always felt that he was an obedient um, <coughs> worker to implement the vision of John 23rd, that he himself, at the beginning, had a difficulty to embrace. What are the, um, now I come to um, the second part, which will be really much shorter, but what are the main lessons that we take from our start time? You can always, you can look up in the manuals the key points of content that Nostra Tate contains. I do not want to bother us with that because you can find it and we need to be everywhere. It is more, let's say, the dynamics that are behind Nostra Tate that now um, are interesting me and I would like to share with you this point. One is this Nostra Tate could come true only in a very specific, a very unique constellation. It was basically the permanent, and that's why they would prefer the word constellation, prefer it over encounter simply because it was something that became stable, permanent. It was the permanent cooperation of John 23rd, who through his diplomatic career, especially when he was in Turkey, was directly involved in helping Jews escape from the Nazi murderers. His, John 23rd's vision, and then this Jesuit, very um, simple scholar, that both together created this non-violent revolution that's one thing to remember, that is, it is really only when I think forces combine that something like true dialogue, it's, it's, all, it's already within, it's not the dialogue with the other, but it's already the dialogue with, with your partner. It's, um, it's only then, when, um, I think, um, this, this work can bear fruits. The second Observation is a little bit more complex, but um, I, I always wonder what made it happen that um, the bishops, who for political reasons, for theological reasons, had resisted something like Nostra Aetate, at least the fourth section, that eventually had approved of it. And it was, to my mind, it was the vision that opened up for 
a future path. It was, in other words, it wasn't so much in the art because of something that um, something terrible that had happened that now we should ask forgiveness for that those bishops were convinced that their Nostra Aetate was the right thing to do. The bishops were convinced because they could see in some ways it was open with way their eyes were open to see that a declaration like that opened up for a new self-understanding of Catholics. And thirdly, this is something I mentioned at the beginning, it is so interesting to see that the initial idea, the initial um, vision of John XXIII, to have a document that is dedicated to the Jewish Christian, uh, the Jewish Catholic relations, um, was then changed into um, a document for the interreligious relations, in some ways in its reception, reversed the process again. Whenever you speak today to uh, a Jew who knows about, let's say, uh, the conversion of Catholics um, towards the Jewish people, certainly this Jew is aware of Nostra Aetate. Nostra Aetate is really this Magna Carta, it's the foundational document of Catholic-Jewish relations. It hasn't happened quite the way for the interreligious dialogue. In the interreligious dialogue, Nostra Aetate simply doesn't play that role. My suspicion I don't have a clear answer why this has happened, but my suspicion is that finally we are pointed again to something that is so specific in this complex relationship between Jews and Christians, and that is the, the, the word that we share. Nostra Tata is the only document ever produced that doesn't quote any church document. Nothing out of the magisterium is ever quoted in this document because there were, were not anything to quote there. It wasn't. But it is filled with scriptural reference. And this scriptural reference, of course, is this common language that Jews and Christians do share. And they share it not only simply put as something there that somehow has an authority, but it is, and this is now something, again, that becomes very important to my mind for the activity to become the reference of the Jewish Catholic Bible. It is very important that both Jews and Christians know that the word that was spoken, that was revealed by God, needs to be revitalized, it needs to be understood and made understood for our time. New. It is a word that we are listening to we have been listening to through um, the gender, previous generation, so not only the word, but also the understanding of the word becomes, as a process at least, something that Jews and Christians can directly um, combine or relate to one another. Now, how do we and the Carmel Bear Center try to take this message and implement it? The Carmel Bear Center was founded in 2002. It's very young. It's the youngest um, institute at the Gregorian University. And already in that short period between 2002 and 2013, I can see an evolution and development. And um, it is in some ways and it's a way of understanding better the process that led to Nostra Aetate. First of all, we privilege more and more constellations. We privilege more and more stable situations where Catholics and Jews can study together 
they learn together and um, teach one another. Instead of uh, having um, just conferences, we really uh, like to have the exchange of students, professors. We like to have co-shared seminars where Desert and rabbis teach together. Always privileged situations where there is a continuity possible that creates these bonds. It is, it is really something we have an exchange program with um, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. So with the, the Jewish students who come to live in Rome, um, maybe in a college, certainly studying with mostly seminarians or religious people at the Royal University to see what effect that has on the, on the longer run. That's one thing. The second is um, the, the um, privilege. This is maybe something a little bit more complex to explain. But um, I, I think it's so very necessary, especially in this particular period of Jewish Catholic dialogue, where after the first generation of great enthusiasm in this dialogue, where there was so much of um, novelty to discover, we have entered now really a phase of a bit of disillusion, of, of um, finding it more difficult, um, not seeing all this interest in this dialogue anymore, a lot of emphasis, and maybe for very good reasons, is now shifted, has now shifted towards more Muslim Catholic um, dialogue away from the Jewish Catholic dialogue. We um, at the Cardinal Beer Center have learned to emphasize much more the process of hermeneutics or the, really the importance of understanding the tradition that comes to us now and we act actively now shape the understanding of the tradition for the future generations. And I'd like to give you an example that maybe that illustrates what I'm trying to say. Um, in Italy and in many European countries, there has been um, established the Day of the Holocaust. It is a national day where in all schools there needs to be a teaching on the Holocaust. And um, it is, teachers find it harder and harder now to sing, do something. So it mostly it comes back to teachers of religion, in Italy you have um, Catholic teaching, Catholic uh, uh, religious instruction, even public schools. So the, the director of the school asks the teacher of the religious instruction to do something for the Holocaust Day. They, everyone, every school has to do something. And teachers are not prepared, for instance, to reactions of, of students today that say, not again. And <coughs> Why don't we talk now maybe about the wall that Israel created and um, the, about the, the situation of the Palestinians? Isn't the Holocaust Day not a way of driving guilt into us to keep us small? And uh, so you teachers, you have a better life than for the months to come. These, these are um, difficult situations that um, teachers have to deal with and they're not very prepared to do that. So last year what we did was we offered a, a series, it was a class, a course, on not so much on how to teach the Holocaust today in schools, I mean we find material on that, and it, but it was to create an awareness that dealing with the Holocaust is indeed very, let's say, a very creative, a very, um, it, it's an endeavor that engages personally. And it has changed so often already in time and in various countries. And just to see that, to learn how 
already the reception of the Holocaust is something that doesn't condemn you to a passive, simply, consummation of serious, horrible images, but it makes you an agent that helps yourself, helps yourself and others and the world to deal with tragic tragedy, to deal with guilt, to deal also with hope and survival. That is a focus that we lack. We, at the Kamaveya Center, we tend now to move away from teaching simply Bible, also because there are a lot of people who uh, are other institutions who can teach the Old Testament or the First Testament. We are much more interested in dealing with how the both traditions have received the Bible and how this reception has been mutually um, helped, assisted to an understanding that today, again, we actively form and shape. The last point, that is, then again, a very simple one, but it's, it's very basic, and it leads right back to where we are here. It is um, very important to learn, as Catholics especially, and this is a contribution that we especially get from the Jewish tradition, how study is really, a, I would say, almost like a sacramental act that is a deliverer of grace in itself, meaning that really studying the texts, learning together, this is very typical of the Jewish tradition. And it's, it's very touching to hear from, from our rabbis that come to the kind of the center when they say that they find the Ignatian's uh, pedagogy so much somehow in sync or in common with um, the Jewish pedagogy. Um, but the emphasis, the emphasis of simply knowing that when you study the text, when you engage in a conversation that aims at being rational, scientific, learned, erudite, that this is a holy activity. Education is indeed is more than, than a means. It is already achieving the goal. The history of relations between our two communities was complex and often painful. I believe that Christian and Jews have a future of hope, a hope that has been constituted by Nostra Aetate, that has been carried on by constellations of people coming together, studying together, cooperating, and this sign of hope now is indeed, to my mind, doing exactly what we learn as Christians that is typical of God's doing. And that is, God has not prevented evil from happening, but he had given possibilities to heal the evil from Thank you very much.